What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Friday, and welcome to this week's Liquor Run. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and this is my old man. Rolling. And today we're going to be taking a look um, at a Rolex and a Mido that have a lot more in common than you would expect uh, over a bottle of what? Borsao from Spain. Let's do it. My favorite wines. Ole. All right, before we jump into the watches or the wine wristwatch check, what do you have, Dan? Panerai. Beautiful watch. This, You've uh, wanted this watch for how many years? Many years. And uh, we many actually years. we actually did a whole a whole in-depth video on your journey to this watch. Yes. And the unboxing of it. Uh, yes. The link is in the description. I highly recommend you guys watch it. Uh, it was kind of an emotional video. Uh, I am wearing my um, personal Omega Seamaster that you and mom so generously uh, bought for me. Um, I have it on, a, on like a beads of rice strap. What do you think? I, you know what? Actually, it worked. I'm not a big fan of that bracelet, but but with that watch, it actually comes together quite nicely. I wear this watch it, more now with the speeds of rice than I ever wore. It's perfect. It's, it's nice and slim. Works well with the suit, too, with the outfit. Thank you very <clears throat> much. Um, okay, let's uh, let's crack open the bottle of wine. Let's talk watches. Well, if there's any value in the watches, there's certainly value in the wine. That's the, co it's the commonality here. That's tremendous value. I've been a big fan of Borsao, and if you read any wine publications uh, like I do, Year in and year out, Borsal always makes that list. Price. This one could be anywhere from seven to nine dollars. And it's just a, a, as they call it, a firecracker of a wine. Isn't that awesome? It is awesome. We've only had this wine a couple yeah. hundred times. This, so uh, for me, this is a, it's kind of an old faithful, you know. You, you, your favorite wines in the world are probably Spanish, right? Oh, yes. But you, you're you a yes. big, huge, huge fan of French wines. Yes. Um, burgundies, white burgundies, but. Spanish wine is, is kind of where he likes to uh, yeah. find himself. You know, it's funny. That's my sweet spot. It's your sweet spot. My dad, if, if there is, there are many things that are synonymous with you um, that I always, you know, tell people about, you know, if I have a little bit too much to drink. But one of your, you know, the images I have of you is with a glass of, of, of Rioja like this, just like this. <laughs> it's yes. barnyard. That's barnyard. what he always says. He goes, yes. But hey, just barn like cows, and you know <laughs> that's oh, you. That. You know, so uh, so this wine is definitely uh, yeah. you. Let's pour. It, it is. It is. Okay. Um, well, while we pour this uh, and, and have our first sip. Oh, and by the way, yeah. Wouldn't you know it? Jorge Jorge Ardon Ardon is the importer. Always remember, check the back of the bottle. Yep. Uh, the importer means a lot more than you might think. That's right. So That's right. Anyway. okay, two watches. Uh, today we're, we're looking at. Um, two watches that you would think are Rolexes, uh, and, and one is, um, but <laughs> where do I start? Do you know what an homage watch is? Well, just by the name alone, it's a, it's a watch that's paying tribute to something else. Exactly right. So so this, this Mido Commander. The homage. Is an homage, right? Uh, and there are so many homages. There, there are homages by Steinhardt. Uh, Salud, by the way. Salud. Brands have built their entire lineup on homage. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, and there's a fine line between homage and ripoff. You yes. Know? Um, I personally think that this is quite a bit of an homage because there are a couple of key differences here. Um, but it's a funny topic. I am not a big homage guy. I happen to think that, you know, um, uh, uh, innovation and in design is very important uh, to evaluate in a watch, right? Okay. But at a certain point, certain price point, you kind of say, well, you can't have everything, you know? So a really, really well-built watch like this Mido, and we'll get into that, um, at, at an, a, a tremendous price point, we're talking well, well, well under $1,000, um, it doesn't really need to be different in its fundamental design cues, like the oyster case or the fluted bezel. Yeah. You know, because of where it sits price-wise. Now, if this was a two, three, four thousand dollar watch, and let's say it had this most incredible hand-finished movement in there, and the prices were, were super high, I would say, you know what? Nah, you know, but the value that a watch like this brings, I can totally overlook the fact that they didn't invent the design. That that watch is a very well executed watch, isn't it? I, it really is. I I gotta tell you, and I'm being completely no, you, honest. You, here. you don't care whether or not the owner sells money. <laughs> it's not your no, business. You know? when, when we had it here before we started shooting, um, I actually thought it was <laughs> I thought it was a Rolex a Tudor. I actually thought it was a Tudor. Well, because it's a jumbo. That's it's really, that's so, really cute. so I said, oh, this is a really cool, and I love. I love the, 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 the color of the face. It's like a salmon dial. Salmon dial, like peach, you know, yeah. uh, so something going on there. 
and uh, and it's got that fluted dial, fluted bezel, a fluted bezel. It, I, anyway, I was just looking at, it, admiring it, and saying, "Wow, that's a really nice timepiece." Not even knowing that that what uh, it was, and I had know, no idea. So I definitely huh. not just admit, but I'm very vocal about. I, I, I do think that you know there, there you do get you do get down points, or, or there are no points given when you're making an homage as far as the design creativity, but. To me, there's one big, big standout element. Um, the, the dial is the obvious yeah. wow winner. The dial is why I would probably buy this watch. Mm -hmm. um, but as someone who has owned it and worn it, mm -hmm. what I'll tell you, and you really should pick up on this as well after I say it, the proportions are incredible. It's a 37 millimeter watch, mm -hmm. which puts it a millimeter over the date just, but it is so much thinner. I mean, you own your yellow gold date just, you've worn my date just a hundred times. Look at the thickness difference here oh yeah this is a and it's bigger yeah. so it's sleeker right. it's sleeker you know yeah. so this is a 34 millimeter date right. and we'll get into it in a second right and then this is a 37 millimeter mito uh -huh. um and once again the, the case is an oyster the bezel is fluted this is stolen from rolex there is no doubt but the way it wears on the wrist is extremely it, different than rolex 100 uh, it, it has a, it has an elegance to it oh no there's a trick yeah. it's great yeah. and it's because yeah. of the thinness and the size right um okay. so for that reason I think it's even more of a win than I initially uh, expected. Can you tell me a little bit about Mido itself? Do you know anything? Yeah, I know a little bit. Yeah, I've owned a couple before. It's not a brand that we that we've dealt with too much, but uh, Mido, particularly their Multi Fort. I'm actually um, this is literally coming off the fly out of my. Mm -hmm. This is kind of funny. Uh, the Multi Fort watch is the Mido that I have become somewhat familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a Multi Fort in the shop right now. Mm -hmm. um, the, I don't know when it came out. Ours is from the 30s, I believe. Uh, but when I was reading about that watch, because I knew nothing about it, I literally knew nothing about it, uh, far from that, it was beautiful. But I c came to learn and understand about the rigorous testing that this watch went through, right? Many brands, uh, you know, really the brands that, that went through serious testing, the brands that really pushed the boundaries of, of not just design, but watchmaking, mm -hmm. they're kind of famous now. You know, we know that Rolex has had tremendous advancements. We know that Patek Philippe has had tremendous, tremendous advancements, but there are brands. You know, um, Agassiz, for example, which was probably one of the most interesting movement, you know, manufacturers in the world at one point. Um, uh, Mido, another one, that no one really cares about. You know, but really contributed a lot, not only to the world of watchmaking, this in, in many degrees, but um, they put a lot of pride in their watches. So I don't think that this watch and the multi fort that we have in the shop are of the same ethos, right? Mm -hmm. The multi fort was a distinctly Mido, you know, heavily, heavily tested and regulated watch, uh, and and this this wasn't. This, this is just a, a wonderful, you know, date just or, or date just or day date uh, homage, a really well executed example. So they're different. You know, one better than, than the other. Most people would take this over the multi fort. I would probably take it over the multi fort in many cases. Um, but the multi fort is, without a question, uh, a more interesting watch from a historical and technological standpoint. So back to you to answer yeah. your question shortly. Mm -hmm. It's a very historically interesting brand that gets no recognition. And now, before we jump into this incredible uh, vintage blue wave date mm -hmm. uh, by Rolex. Let's talk about this wine a little bit more. Let me pour you a glass. I've been a huge fan of this wine for many, many years. Uh, probably like maybe close to a decade. Uh, th this is a Grenache based wine. So it, it's it's all Grenache from an area called Campo de Borja. Do you think Grenache and, is a household name? Uh, I think people drink Grenache, uh, but probably it. probably not knowing it, they'll drink Grenache from uh, from uh, the French Grenache. You know, it's, this is Garnacha. Okay. You know, and quite frankly. Grenache's roots have been traced to Spain, so it's probably an indigenous Spanish, Spanish. grape and not a French grape. Uh, but 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 doesn't matter. Um, the fact is that Grenache uh, it grows very very well in, in Spain and in this part of Spain, and it makes it. This is a nice round wine. Mm -hmm. it, it's got good berry up mm -hmm. front, right? It's not overly tannic. No, it's soft. Uh, so I find this to be a good, uh, nice food wine. It's a flavorful wine. It's a, it's a great wine. It's a nice. It's That's got, a good way. It's a good it. balance. Uh, the way that I taste it is 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 it does have good it does have good fruit. It is without food, wonderful and and large and tasty enough to have on its own. Yeah. But it is still like you said, use the word soft, soft enough to kind of enjoy with many different kinds of food. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not this big, um, like when you know, when you cracked open the Rubicon, you yes. know, it's a wonderful wine. Right. We enjoyed it after a while, but uh, but it does overwhelm food. It, it will. This is a kind of wine it will. that it will. is very unimposing. Absolutely. Now keep in mind, so going back to the French side, 
you know, you'll find Grenache in um, in southern France. Mm-hmm. You'll find it in the Rhone Valley because mm-hmm. they'll mix it with Syrah. There'll, there'll be some, you know, Rhone wines that are probably more Grenache based, but some that are more Syrah based. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not quite sure if it's northern Rhone or southern Rhone at, at, at this point. Who dominates where? But but uh, but we like those wines. We like Rhone based wines. Okay. So it's not a stretch for us to be drinking this drinking and liking this. this. Yeah. So, uh, but the bottom line here is the va- is is the, the value. The value. The fact that you can get a wine. This is an entry level call wine. Call it eight dollars. But call it eight bucks. You, this is a monstrous wine. I mean, if, if, it, it just packs so much punch. Yep. F- for the for the bottle. I mean, you can't. You really can't beat it. You can. You can put this this wine really up to some more assertive food, mm-hmm. right? Even like even steak. Quite frankly. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, like a chimichurri. Yeah, right, you know. Right. You, 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 yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That would be quite yeah, nice. That'd be quite nice. Yeah. A really yeah. earthy. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> that'd be delicious. With a little char Excuse on me. the steak. That'd be delicious. Yeah. So again, uh, not to belabor the point. But this is one of, really, one of the, the greatest values in, in wine year in and year out. Isn't that great? It, yeah, yeah. And it's not just me saying it. it. It's not that it should matter that the authorities say it, but, right. but every year, year in and year out, you'll see it in Wine Spectator. Robert Parker raves about it. Uh, there's a, but, really but even more incredible is the fact that they keep the price at the same level. Yeah. A wine with so much press. And you wonder why. It, I, I, because you look at press, I mean, you know, press is the point where, okay, now you can. I mean, I, I spoke to someone one time about at a bar that, that, that you know, they were in restaurants and they are in bars, and uh, the prices of their drinks at the bar was, were very affordable, you know, and it was Manhattan. I was like, that's yeah. kind of odd. And, and, and he kind of, the way his kind of opinion was, listen, I've got, I've got uh, three or four restaurants, okay, uh, the prices at those restaurants for the drinks, they are higher. Yes. But they've been around for two, the three, right. five, six years, you know. The, you, we don't, at this point in the business, we're just we're doing anything we can to get more people coming and having a wonderful time and we want to be a part of their lives and then yes we'll, we'll bring our bar prices to where they really should be yes but it's funny that this brand has decided to say you know what eight bucks is cool with us yeah when, when possibly we'd be having the same conversation about value at ten yeah and that's two bucks that's right that's it, huge it's at eight dollars I yeah. mean yeah. you know a two dollar raise at thirty two isn't a big deal. But, but an extra two bucks at eight? And, and if you want to splurge, you go up to their Tres Picos lab, uh, label, which is the same, you know, it's a, the vines are from higher altitude. Okay. And maybe even older vines, it'll it'll set you back like a whole $13. <laughs> wow. So, but but Borsal, uh, uh, definitely one for, for everyone to uh, to go out and get and, and to chat wine and, and to watch us. You heard it from the man himself? Yeah, yeah. All Bors, right. Borsal. Blue date you know because i've told you a million times yes blue rolexes in the dress world are king yes right people have asked me why do i say that mm-hmm. for many reasons one the demand fine but why does the demand exist everyone's like, oh demand wow f-ing genius congratulations you figured out demand but the, why is the demand there right rarity does help if things you can't have you want yes but really, the real, on this particular issue, that's more of a Paul Newman thing, but on the real blue, the value of a blue dial is because although, yes, it is formal and, and, and dressy and conservative in so many ways, it's still kind of not. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's in no conservative person's gonna look at this dark, beautiful blue wave dial and say, that's, that's, too, that's too much for me. So you get to appease those people and then people who are looking for something with more funk and more taste and more, you know, just different different mm-hmm. variables, they look at it and they go, oh my God, like that is just so different, I want it. So the blue, in my opinion, brings everyone together. It's something everyone can agree on. Yeah. Because it's right in the middle. And not in like a milk toast way. I mean, right in the middle in the most beautiful, in the most beautiful way. Yeah, there's just a certain elegance uh, with the, the color of this, of this, of this watch. Um, and it, I could just you really even envision it with different different bracelets oh or my straps. God. Brown, yeah, a light tan suede. Yeah. Yes, you could do orange yeah. with it. You could do yeah. anything. Yeah, that's just gorgeous. How it's, about it's a uh, lovely watch, like a maroon? And I love this. I love the, uh, the so the, the bubble case, the bubble the, bu- the, the bubble, bubble dial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, dial. Uh, uh, crystal. Yeah, crystal. it's beautiful as well. I love the I love the bezel. 
yeah. on this. That's another thing, too, that's unique about this watch. It's, it's I haven't seen it too much. Pretty much so-called an engine turn bezel. Okay. Um, it's not quite technically what we know as it, but I, but I believe that this is also referred to as engine turn bezel. Um, a really good friend of mine, Paul. Paul's probably watching. Cheers to Paul. Cheers, Paul. You know Paul. Um, for the first, I, I, I love engine turn bezel because I think they're pretty, right? Um, but we were, we were having wine one day, mm -hmm. and, and he goes... Um, but really, it's so interesting when you look at a vintage Rolex engine turn bezel. Like, well, why? He goes, well, because it really is a, 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 a truly traditional, you know, mid 20th century style that has since been abandoned. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. Fluted yeah. still exists. Yeah. Fluted sure. is everywhere. Right. Everyone does fluted. Not even just Rolex. Rolex, right. Omega. Right. God, right. everyone does everyone fluted. Does. Yes. You know? Yes. But engine turned is kind of a classic design trait that we have since just. Eh, it's vintage. Walked away from. Walked away from. Yeah. Uh, it, no, so so he sold me, you know, yeah. on on engine turn yeah. bezels, um, for more than their beauty, but for you know what they kind of mean. Yeah. I think this the, is beautiful. The nostalgia behind the design. What do you think about the thirty four millimeters on my wrist? To be honest. I think it works just fine. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I, my, my wrist yeah. is just under seven yeah. inches. Yeah. It works. I think it's yeah. beautiful. Absolutely. You could carry that watch very well. There's no doubt. It may not work, you know, for some people with huge wrists. Especially people like Tori, eight inch right. wrist. Right. It's tough. It's sure. not easy. Right. But I still think it's super respectful. Yeah. I would, I would super respect someone like that. Um, but I, I've sold these, I've sold 34 millimeter right. Rolexes to people everywhere yeah. from six inches to Probably eight, even truthfully. Yeah. Uh, but I completely understand why eight inch, eight inch. You know, it sounds like it's a big, it's a big wrist. Uh, eight inch wrist people are going to say, "Well, that's a little too small." No disrespect. I get what you mean. I, I yeah. don't agree per se, but I get what you mean. And, and we're living in a new generation, a different generation, where people just they just tend to gravitate towards bigger uh, watches. I remember growing up, guys that had you know they had thighs for wrists. The biggest and, and men in the yeah, world, the and, toughest and, 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 guys yeah. in the world, yeah, Muhammad and, Ali. Yeah, and they wore they were smaller. They're smaller who, watches. Who, who's yeah. a scarier guy than Muhammad Ali? Yeah, yeah. who's a more right, traditional right. man? Right, than Muhammad Ali. No, very few people, right? And, love, yeah. love him or hate him, he was wearing. Yeah, the guy was a the yeah. guy was a giant. Yeah, he's a giant. He had tree trunks right. for wrists. Right, he wore a Cartier tank that was yeah. this big. Right, and that's so, proof of point. Not because he was a style icon. No. Because the watch felt good right. in his wrist, and yeah. it didn't it didn't challenge his you know preconception of what was a man. Mm -hmm. And not to say that people who don't like small watches, not to say that they're, they're afraid of not being looked at as men. Not the point. Some people are, but not most people. Um, the point is, uh, if, if if you've never tried one on, try one on. Yeah. If you've ever tried a thirty-four millimeter, particularly an Oyster, because Oysters are way different than Omegas, try one on. If you don't like it, cool, no worries. But. Can't knock it yeah. until you tried it. And it sounds like it's a big, it's And I genuinely think that size is so easy to fall in love with. I'm sure that so many of you that are watching, and please comment if I'm correct in, in this comment section below, were in big watches. We're in 40s, 42s, 44s mm -hmm. exclusively. Mm -hmm. You wear 36s, you wear 34s all the time. And would never dream of touching a 36 or a 34. Right. Did once. And then they're like, oh my God, my GMT seems huge. Yes. Or my, my whatever, the Breitling seems enormous. Right. Well, it does. Yeah. Your eye shifts, your wrist, what you expect to see on your wrist changes. Right. You know, but that's it. I think we did a great episode. Hey, this is great. We had a good time doing this uh, this this episode. Yeah? Beautiful bottle of wine. Thank you so much for bringing in. It's Both of these watches Thank you. are, uh, you know, by chance uh, for sale in the watch shop at theoandharris.com. If you have any interest in either of them, uh, whether or not they are sold uh, by the time you see this, shoot me an email. Happy to answer any of your questions and talk watches. Cheers, guys. Happy Cheers. Friday. Cheers. Salud. Salud.